the wave sensor had been lowered into the water from an outrigger beyond the breakers. We had to hurry to stay with our schedule. Winter was descending on the Antarctic. Studying the weather maps of July 5th, Bill Powers noted a great storm building up south of New Zealand. This storm would impart energy to the sea and create the wave trains we wished to study. In Palliser, New Zealand, on July 6th, the waves from this storm arrived. The station had gone into operation just one day before. At last, our instruments could measure some real Antarctic waves. Frank Peterson, in charge of the New Zealand station, was pleased to note that the wave sensor was working smoothly. Each two-second reading gave a sample of the wave height measured to the nearest tenth millimeter. We had all gotten pretty good at reading the tape code. It gave us the advantage of an on-the-spot analysis of the waves. This is a plot of the sea surface against time. The profile is irregular. A typical interval from one crest to the next is 16 seconds. This is the wave period. Knowing the wave period, we could predict the travel time of a wave group and estimate its arrival at the next station. The velocity and length of water waves is determined by their period. Long period waves are fast. These cross the screen in five seconds. Short waves are slower. These take 10 seconds to cover the same distance and are therefore traveling at half the velocity of the previous long waves. However, the velocity of a wave group is different from the velocity of individual waves. On the leading edge of a wave group, the first wave repeatedly disappears to be replaced by wave number two. The wave group advances at half the speed of the individual waves. The wave front crosses the screen in 10 seconds. The individual waves, with twice the velocity, cross the screen in 5 seconds. Group velocity can be computed if the period is known. At New Zealand, the period was measured at 16 seconds. The corresponding group velocity was 27 miles per hour. In Samoa, it was the arrival of the wave group that interested us. We were not trying to identify individual waves. On July 8th, the waves arrived as expected. Here the waves were right on our doorstep. We lived in a Samoan folly on the edge of the village. The house was built entirely of coconut palm, an ideal place to work on waves. The house was open on all sides. It afforded lots of comfort and no privacy. To operate our recording equipment, we had taken along our own generator. As at all the stations, we recorded for three hours, twice each day, from 4 to 7 a.m. and from 4 to 7 p.m. Each day, we punched out 10,000 data points to be digested by the computer at home. We hardly ever missed a measurement. The equipment worked admirably, and my initial apprehension soon vanished. Data taking became quite routine. My wife and some of the Samoans learned to operate the recording equipment. Our measurements indicated some loss of energy between New Zealand and Samoa. But lots of wave energy remains. Preliminary analysis showed that the waves at Samoa were more regular than at New Zealand. This is because the long waves, which move rapidly, have separated from the short waves, which are slower. This is a phenomenon known as dispersion. 
To see dispersion, one can toss a handful of pebbles into a pool and watch carefully. As in full-scale storms, waves of all shapes and sizes are generated and they spread out confusedly in all directions at once. As they leave the storm area, the waves begin to sort themselves out. The long waves move out fast, the short waves more slowly. Away from the storm, the confused sea has become swell. The waves are separated and regular. And as the distance from the storm increases, the long waves in front become even further separated from the lagging short waves. The wave train stretches out more and more. The further the group has traveled, the long it will take to pass a wave station. The computations taking dispersion into account made it possible to predict not only the storm waves arrival time at other stations, but also to estimate their duration. I went to Pango Pango to pass this information on by radio. Radio amateur Paul Hodges got us in touch with the other wave stations. Good morning, Frank. Uh, everything's fine. Station going well. We're having a rather nice sequence of waves come in, which reached their peak probably early this morning. Probably associated with a New Zealand storm. Do you know what this means? With a duration... I estimated the arrival of the storm waves in Palmyra on July 10th. I informed Gordon Groves in Palmyra that taking dispersion into account, he could expect the waves there to have a duration of two days. The disturbance had passed in a day and a half in Samoa. And wondered if it looked like uh, might be getting some good waves. Coming into uh, Honolulu, four or five days. In Hawaii, the same wave group will arrive on July 11th. And the waves should, because of dispersion, take three days to pass. Frank Snodgrass's calculation agreed with mine. If it does come through, I'll uh, let Flip know. And I'll also wire Alaska and alert them all. How long ago was it that you talked to them? So everyone could anticipate the arrival of the great waves from our first storm. At the same time, Frank Snodgrass had learned from New Zealand about the birth of a new Antarctic storm. Uh, we have 40 to 45 knots of wind at latitude 64 and longitude 177 east. This is a mean wind. The fresh storms building up in the Antarctic would happily provide an abundance of waves for us to measure throughout the summer and enable us hopefully to reproduce the results of our first storm. The kind of control plots we were making with the punch paper tape while on station were inadequate for detailed analysis. While the gathering of data continued, the paper tapes were regularly flown to La Jolla for computer processing so that Frank and Klaus could keep a running account of the experiment. In order to see our waves most clearly, we had decided to look at them in a special way. We programmed the computer to evaluate and plot out a spectrum of the wave data. A wave spectrum is a plot of wave energy against wave frequency. Energy is represented vertically and frequency is represented horizontally. With the low frequencies, or long periods on the left, the high frequencies on the right. The arrival of the wave group from the Antarctic shows up as a distinct peak in the spectrum with a given peak frequency. Because of dispersion, the peak first shows up at the low frequency or long period end of the spectrum. These were the first wave arrivals from the storm. On later records, the peak gradually shifts to higher frequencies. These higher frequencies, or shorter waves, arrive later because of dispersion. After several days, the wave group has passed. The peak disappears. As our waves progressed northward, they encountered waves from local storms. The swell passed through these locally generated waves like ghosts and continued their journey towards flip virtually intact. Flip had arrived at her lonely North Pacific station on her first major assignment at sea. 